Today we're talking with Dr. Jonathan Gibson about this new book here, Ruin Sinners to Reclaim. Hello, welcome to Clarity and Brevity. Today I'm joined by Dr. Jonathan Gibson, who's Associate Professor of Old Testament at Westminster Theological Seminary. And we're talking about this new, fairly significant and linked volume, Ruin Sinners to Reclaim. So, Johnny, tell us, what is this book? Uh, it's a book about uh, total depravity. Uh, the subtitle is Sin and Depravity in Historical, Biblical, Theological, and Pastoral Perspective. So it's a book in a series of five. We're doing the doctrines of grace. Our first book was on limited atonement. From heaven he came and sought her. This book's on total depravity, ruined sinners to reclaim. And uh, Which comes from a hymn. Right, all the titles of these books come from hymns? Yes, so each, each book's going to have a title from a hymn. And so the next books will be on election, effectual calling, and perseverance of the saints. And so this is not a book you wrote individually. Uh, you gathered a group of contributors. And what is the goal of this book? Why do we need this book? Well, it's a bit like a, an illness, isn't it? Uh, if you don't diagnose the illness right, uh, you're not going to... Um, get the right medicine or the right surgery to deal with the problem that you have. And uh, it's the same with our spiritual health. If, if we don't define sin properly, then we're not going to define the solution properly. Um, you know, Paul says to Timothy in 1 Timothy, this is a faithful saying, worthy of all acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Uh, what we need is a savior because we're a sinner not a psychologist because we're anxious or you know re relationally maladjusted or something like that uh, so we've got to diagnose the problem before we can actually get the solution so that's why it's important to get clear on sin and as you can see from the thickness um, this book is nearly twice as thick as the first one and some people may think why did you spend so much time on the doctrine of sin well as I say if we're if we're going to get the gospel right then we need to get the bad news right first of all. So maybe some have heard the term total depravity. Uh, can you explain what that means and maybe what it doesn't mean? Yeah let me start with what it doesn't mean first. People hear that term total depravity and think um, you, must, I mean, you must mean that we are as depraved as we possibly could be. Uh, but that's not what it means. It's referring to the extent to which sin affects us as a human being. Uh, it affects our thoughts, our desires, our emotions, our will, um, uh, our body. And so really total depravity is referring to the extent to which sin has affected us. In terms of, of the extent to which it's, it's affected us, um, this is a countercultural book. Perhaps we could say that, that it, it doesn't approach the, uh, the problems with humanity in the same way that the culture might. Uh, what does the Bible have to say about where sin comes from, how sin affects us? Uh, just expand on that a little bit. You've got a number of chapters in here. So biblically, what are, some of the, what are some of the tenets that you're trying to cover here? Well, the chapter on the Pentateuch will deal with where sin's origin comes from. It, it comes from outside a good creation. It comes from the serpent who comes from outside. Uh, it comes from the devil who fell from heaven. Uh, who was once an angel. Uh, so that's the very beginning and origin of sin in that sense. Uh, the devil then comes in in the form of a servant, tempts Adam and Eve uh, in the garden and uh, causes them to transgress God's law, which is really the definition of, of sin. So that's where uh, sin comes from. And uh, what we're trying to do in uh, this book is unpack, well, what does it mean that we have all fallen in Adam. What does that actually mean? Uh, so we have chapters dealing with the imputation of Adam's sin to us and his guilt. Uh, we are not just corrupted by what's outside us. Uh, we're now corrupted by what's inside us. Jesus said that basically out of the heart come all of the sins of sexual immorality, anger, lust, um, jealousy, envy. These come from within us. Uh, but Sin's first origin was outside us with the serpent tempting Adam and uh, through Adam's fall it's become internal. It's now a problem that's inside us and needs to be dealt with. Our society generally says that your problem as a human being 
is outside of you, it's the society, it's the culture that's sort of affecting you and corrupting you or uh, tarnishing you. Uh, and what the Bible says is, no, actually the problem's inside of you. In, in the introduction, you and is it your brother who wrote the introduction and mm -hmm. David Gibson, uh, you all talk about some of the, the relevance of this. Can maybe ex talk about some of the things that come up in that introduction that set the tone for the book? Yeah, so we deal with the issue of concupiscence, uh, which is really a big word that just means lust or desire. And uh, that's been understood different ways in church history. And so uh, what we try to do in the uh, introduction is engage that whole issue of concupiscence. Uh, the Roman Catholic view is that, yes, our lusts, our concupiscence is corrupted, but so long as you don't act upon it, you're, you've nothing to repent of. Uh, but the Protestant Reformed Orthodox position is that concupiscence itself is sin. And so not only do you need to repent of actions as a result of evil lusts in your heart, but you also need to repent of the evil lusts themselves. And so that's what we try to engage with uh, in the introduction. So walk us through the structure of the book. What are the, the categories of essays? And give us maybe some, some examples and maybe some of the things that, that readers might find here. Maybe some of the, the interesting points or the chapters that uh, particularly are, speak to our cultural moment. Yeah, so each of the five books is going to have the same structure. Historical, biblical, theological, pastoral perspectives. Uh, we start with history because we don't believe we exegete the text of Scripture on a blank slate. You know, we, we, we are exegeting it in conversation with those who have gone before us. So in a sense what we do is we start with the historical to set the domain and the categories and the terms of how this doctrine has been spoken about. And so we have chapters dealing with uh, sin in the patristics, uh, sin in Augustine, Obviously, he's the key guy in the early church that confronts Pelagius with his heretical views of human nature. Uh, and then we trace the doctrine of sin all the way through the medieval period, um, through Luther, uh, into the post-Reformation period, and up to the Synod of Dort, and then on to Old Princeton and the imputation of Adam's sin held by the Princetonian theologians like the Hodges. and. Uh, um, even looking at some English particular Baptists of the 17th century. So that's the historical section. The biblical one <clears throat> takes the main sections of the Bible, the Pentateuch, the wisdom books, the prophets, the Gospels, Acts, Paul, uh, some of the Catholic epistles, uh, the Johannine literature, and it traces the doctrine of sin through those. The theological section is a bit more diverse. We deal with sin in comparative religions. How do other religions view the doctrine of sin. Um, whence this evil? Uh, look at the whole idea of theodicy. You know, who who was the author of sin? Is God the author of sin if he ordained all things to come to pass? Uh, that's James Anderson. And then we have two chapters on the covenant of works with Adam, where we're really trying to understand how we become sinners because of a covenant that God made with Adam. Um, concupiscence is a chapter we have a whole chapter devoted to with Stephen Wedgworth. And then there's some other chapters in there about um, the noetic effects of um, sin and original sin in modern theology and scholars like uh, Schleiermacher, uh, people like that. And, and explain what are the noetic effects of sin? What does that refer to? Uh, that's really how sin affects your mind. <clears throat> As I mentioned earlier, total depravity, it affects all aspects of us, our will, our thoughts, but also our mind. And so uh, we need the light of God to really understand anything in this world. You know, Psalm 36, verse 9, in your light we see light. And uh, we actually need the light of God and the help of God by His Spirit to understand anything in this world properly uh, because sin has corrupted even our minds. Uh, the final essay in the theological section is actually a positive one in a book that's predominantly negative. Uh, that's by Mark Jones on uh, the sinlessness of Christ, the impeccability of Christ, and why that's really important for the gospel. And then there's uh, a pastoral section dealing with the impact of secularization on the understanding of sin. That's David Wells. Uh, the uh, a whole area of uh, elenctics with uh, Dan Strange. He unpacks that aspect of apologetics, the unmasking 
uh, of sin and then we have uh, evangelizing fallen people counseling fallen people and Al Mohler uh, brings the book to a close with how do we preach to sinners in a secular age so who is your primary audience for this book who would this really uh, you know benefit the most I think pastors is really our goal uh, to equip them with good material so that if they're preaching through different books of the Bible there's obviously the biblical material but they can also tie it to the historical and theological and pastoral theological students uh, but also you know interested uh, well-read laity people who like to be stretched uh, some of the essays are uh, on the more technical side others are essays that a, a Christian who's a keen reader could read and so you're going to have uh, the ability to jump through this book and find whatever topic might be relevant. Maybe you're preaching on a particular issue, or maybe there's a topical issue. So it's a big book, but you don't have to read the whole thing from start to finish. Yeah, I mean, let's be honest. Have you ever read a complete book of edited essays? You know, we, as as uh, academics and pastors, we tend to dip into these books, don't we? They look good on the shelf. That's the main thing. Uh, and then we sort of go to them when we're dealing with a particular topic in our lectures, or uh, if you're writing a sermon on some. Uh, book of the Bible you're like oh you know I'm in John's gospel I've come across the doctrine of sin uh, let me pick up that book and read the essay on John John's view of sin so that's really what we have in mind it sits on your shelf as a good reference book where you turn to it over a course of your ministry uh, dipping into it um, as you come across things so final question here uh, you've alluded to this but uh, you mentioned that to get the uh, to get the remedy right, we need to understand the problem. Maybe you could just say a few more words about how important it is to recognize the biblical doctrine of sin in relation to the gospel message from the scriptures. Well, again, how do you define sin? You know, people say, you know, sin is uh, something that just makes you feel bad. And so, therefore, the gospel that people will preach in response to that will be, well, here's some self-help tips to make you feel better in life if the effects of this fallen world are getting you down and getting you depressed here are some things that can help uh, but in the book we you know various chapters define sin as the bible defines it and that is a transgression of god's law and god is holy and we've offended this god and so in order for us <clears throat> to be put right with him to be reconciled to him we need a payment to be made for that transgression of sin and the good news of the gospel is that christ comes he lives the perfect life under the law which we haven't done because we've transgressed that law he dies and is cursed for sin on the cross because of the transgression of law and then he rises again from the dead to give us new life he ascends into heaven so that we can go there and he is currently interceding for us because we can still continue to sin and so Christ is the answer to our sin uh, as the perfect man who lived under the law he died the death that we deserve but couldn't pay and so because of that we can have righteousness credited to our account um, which is what Adam was supposed to have done for us but never did but Christ now does that for us and we can also have our sins washed away we can actually have them cleansed and so that's why it's important to understand the doctrine of sin because it makes the gospel look uh, all the more glorious and it uh, points up the beauty and uh, wonder of the work of our Savior. Amen. Uh, so thank you, Johnny, for joining us. The book is called Ruin Sinners to Reclaim. I encourage you to take a look at it. Uh, thanks for watching. I hope this has been helpful. Remember to keep it clear and focus on Christ.